Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Friday edition, episode 716. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's February 4th, 2022. All right, so let, let's set up the show real quick for you before we get too far. I am in an RV in the middle of Florida, and the sun is beating down on me. It's 75 degrees, and so we could conduct a really, really good audible version of Unscripted. I had to turn the AC off. So we may seem rushed. George will seem comfortable, but at some point you're going to see little sweat beads and my face is going to get red and that's just that's part of the, the sacrifice I'm willing to make for my audience. There, out of the way. George, how are you doing this week? I'm poor, Kevin. I'm poor. <laughs> for the first time since 1969, the Conger family, uh, two, three generations, are mercedes list. I got rid of the last Mercedes uh, I owned uh, this past week. I got a great price for it. Used car prices are out of this world. Yeah, absolutely. And I got it. Was a, it was cons- the insurance company called it a uh, total loss. And I'm figuring I was going to get two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000. I got multiples of that wow. because the used car prices go. Well, don't wow me because on Monday, Susan had a uh, root canal and crowns replaced. And so. <sighs> All that money, all that trip to, you know, all that uh, vacation money or money for me to go out shopping, find a new car to rebuild and all this and that, it went into uh, porcelain things in my wife's mouth. So I had to say, you know, happy wife, new car. (laughs) Happy wife, car project. So George's wife is, well, she feels terrible, but she's happy. Mm -hmm. And I'm still trying to recover from COVID-like flu or whatever I had, but mm-hmm. uh, well, I've, now, I've not I've been sick longer, but not as violently have you have been in the past few days. Right after I finished recording the show of last week, you know, I'd flown back from Connecticut. Um, I went to bed that evening and I got hit with what people call the norovirus, the stomach flu, the 24-hour bug, the, oh, you don't want to do it when you're almost 60. And so I spent the night... Uh, next to the porcelain idol in the bathroom, uh, doing what you don't want to do uh, for many hours. And, uh, you know, it's a 24-hour bug, but it's a it's a seven-day recovery, especially, you know, at this age. I haven't been on the bike since I've been back. I haven't done it. I, I got up the energy yesterday to go get the mail. That's... <laughs> That, that's my energy level right now as we, uh, we're we recovering from the, the norovirus. So, George, uh, and now we're sounding like old Jewish mothers. So enough about our, our health. Let's talk about what's going on in the news. And I got a couple emails from concerned viewers who said, you know, in episode 714, you talked about uh, doing a little segment with the upcoming um, candidates for Pittsburgh Bishop. Yes, we did. We're sorry. We had breaking news about the conclave. Uh, Archbishop Foley Beach called for a conclave to happen in South Carolina uh, right after the uh, consecration of Chip Edgars, and we we reported that. We left out the Pittsburgh segment. We'll do the Pittsburgh segment next. If you've not seen the conclave story, go back to episode 715, and you can watch it there. So let's talk about the uh, Pittsburgh candidates, George. I have a screenshot with them up, and I'll put them up here. That's not the one. That's not the one. Here we go. And uh, well, it's going to be a fun to talk. Well, the prov- the, uh, the search committee has given the Diocese of Pittsburgh uh, an invitation to uh, basically an Episcopal food court. Mm-hmm. You know, you go to the mall and you can go to the food court. And if you want Chinese, your wife can have Italian and your child can have barbecue or whatever. We've got three different candidates that are not comparable in experience and interest and background. First, you have a parish priest, Peter Frank. Peter is known to Kevin and I for 20 odd years, I guess, sure. yeah. at, at this stage. Peter, for the last 10 plus years, has been rector of, I think it's Epiphany in Chantilly, Virginia. That's right. Very successful parish priest, a mm-hmm. great pastor, loved by his people, built that church, uh, came out of the Diocese of Pittsburgh, has uh, parish experience in Pittsburgh. Next person is Joel Scandrett. Joel is an academic. 
And Joel is at Trinity Seminary. He was involved in the creation of the Anglican Catechism. He's written books with J.I. Packer. This is somebody with serious theological credentials. The third is a not-for-profit leader, Alex Cameron from Chicago. Now, this is somebody who can run a diocese. So you basically have a choice of a pastor, an academic theologian, and a manager. And it's not like you've got Peter Frank is against running against somebody with less parish experience plus somebody with more parish experience. So no, you're trying to compare yeah. the three. You basically are walking into the food court and you're trying to decide what do I feel like today? And well, it, this but, is the... But that's the difference. Normally you go into uh, your convention and you're choosing from uh, three local uh, priests who all have the same experience to one degree or another. Mm -hmm. Here you have completely different job dynamics in their resume. Uh, general manager, well, that may work for the diocese. Academic, that might work for this diocese. A uh, parish priest, that might work for this diocese. I, I, th I think the the parish uh, or the the selection committee here has made the choice rather difficult. Not so much difficult, but it's made it very stark. Sure. In other words, you have you as a voter in Pittsburgh have to decide what is the priority for the diocese at this time. Do we have a management crisis? Do we need to have theological rigor and be a shining light? Uh, do we need a parish priest to pastor us after some of the grief we've had over the past few years? Mm -hmm. So each of these are worthy candidates. Each would be an excellent bishop, but they would be different bishops. I think that the, the telling point will be the dog and pony show where the three candidates go to various places for meetings with the voters and people will come away thinking they'll be predisposed towards what do I need and then they'll decide whether they like the guy or they don't well so but so this... if I if I if I were being strategic yeah. uh, people have already made up their mind what they think the diocese needs and then they're going to decide do I like the guy who represents what I want now if they don't like him then they'll find a new need so this is almost like a negative search in the sense that if I think we need an academic, and if I like Joel Scandard at the at the Dog and Pony Show, I'm voting for him. Yeah, sure, absolutely. But if I don't like Joel, then maybe I think we need something else. Yeah. So in other well, words, it's it's it, it's it's your it's your game to lose, but, uh, if you will. Well, it's also a timing thing. This person is not replacing Bishop Duncan. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. uh, people remember Archbishop Duncan is the former bishop of the Diocese of Pittsburgh. There was a, not an interim, but uh, a previous bishop, Jim Hobby, was there for a couple of years. Uh, it just didn't work out. The, so you're not stepping into to Archbishop Duncan's shoes here. That that gambit's all out. This, it's kind of a brand new ball game here. We're starting over, brand new playing field. Here's our three choices. Um, you as the diocese need to sit down and, and let us know um, who is the best pick here. And they're all good picks, you know, from one, from one stand to the other. So it's interesting to see this as a uh, thing. All right, let's move on to our next story. Um, next story is interesting because uh, Anglican TV became famous because I would sit down and interview people. I in, my, my first big interview was um, uh, Bishop Ackerman back at Hope in the Future. And so sitting down and with a camera talking to people about the church life and talking about the politics of the day, made Anglican TV very, very uh, popular. I had a very great interview with, with Bishop Duncan right after uh, Bishop Love's consecration about uh, dealing with uh, 815 and, and Second Avenue and all the politics. And it was, it was a great interview. So I know the value of interviews and I know the value that that can have in your ministry. I have read recently that Justin Welby has been offered a half hour gig uh, to interview people by the BBC where he's going to sit down with uh, church people and other people in the in the uh, um, British society and do and conduct interviews and I thought oh boy he'll do great maybe not <laughs> so let's talk because there's a lot of video of Justin Welby on the internet already and I don't know if he has and we'll, we'll discuss this this uh, vowel later not vowel, uh, constant later, but uh, doesn't have it, George. Doesn't have it. 
Yeah. If this were Rowan Williams, I say, I would say oh, excellent yeah, idea. Yeah. What a Rowan, one one of Rowan Williams' strengths was his wit, his conversational ability, his quickness, his available, uh, his vast knowledge of many many issues. It'd and be his, ab with it. his ability to speak with the eyebrows. Remember, he would just yes. bring that one up a little bit. And you're like, ooh, I got the right question. He's thinking. He's thinking. Absolutely. Now, Justin Welby does not seem to shine in those same areas. And they have been putting out videos from Lambeth Palace with Justin for years, and he doesn't really get very good viewership. Now, it could be the production values are poor. It could be the writing is poor. It could be anything. Marketing. But Absolutely. Marketing. But he's just not been able to be shown to be able to hold an audience. Mm -hmm. So that means he's going to be successful by his guests. But will they want to bring on guests who will make him uncomfortable and make him, if you will, beat him in a conversation? Sure. Or will they want to bring in people who will echo his views? Um, I, from a strategic point of view, from a professional broadcasting point of view, the idea is wonderful, but the guy you, the host you have planned isn't ideal. Um, in other words, uh, Johnson Tomo can be combative, it, he can be wonderfully ignorant, and he can be happily ignorant, and it doesn't, and, but it makes for good TV, him in conversation with people whom he disagrees. Sure. Just, Justin Welby has that sort of English infection of niceness, that he wants to be nice because he's been culturally attuned to do that. And uh, you just, I don't see how that's, no, you can't have Sting uh, every week or, uh, <laughs> or some British rocker every week to no. sort of bring in the audience. At a certain point, you're going I'll, to have to I'll, have. I sure. would love to see an Elton John, Justin Welby interview. I think that would be great. I mean, yeah, you, there are people he could interview that I would sit down and, and tune in for. But I would like to see topical. This is the Archbishop of Canterbury, leader of the Anglican Communion. The title of the interviews are Conversations of Christ on Christ. That would be well, great. I'd watch that. Let's look, well, let's think think sort of uh, programmatically here. Mm -hmm. Who are the best, if you will, interviewers, conversationalists, talk show hosts? Well, from an, and I'm just talking about America yeah. now because our viewers okay. mostly well, American. We have on the far, far left, Ultra Sleaze is Howard Stern. Yeah. On the other side, you can go back to the 70s. You had the Dick Cavett. Dick uh, Cavett. Cavett. Dick Cavett. Phil uh, Johnny Carson. Yeah. yeah. In other yeah. words, the success of people like Dick Cavett, Johnny Carson, Jay Leno. Sure. Um, as opposed to the current crop of late night hosts, because they're not interviewers or talk show hosts anymore. They're basically stand up comedians who then. But, but that was Jim, you, you look at uh, Johnny Carson. He could take Martha off the farm, still holding her pitchfork, put her in the chair, and it was the most delightful 20-minute interview you've ever seen. He could interact with just about anybody, anybody and draw yeah. from them. It's sure. the same with, and, this, and like, let's say, Rowan, uh, Justin Welby's persona is maybe closer to Dick Cavett's than to Johnny Carson, Dick Cavett being uh, the almost stereotypical Yale sure. uh, type New Yorker, even though he was from Nebraska. <laughs> um, even then, but Dick Cavett could work and bring his guests into his weak areas and keep the conversation, you know, alive and stintillating and interesting. Can Justin Welby do that? Mm -hmm. Well, well, the he BBC's hasn't gonna, been yeah. Well, the BBC's hasn't gonna try, been it. you know. But is he gonna be Ellen, Oprah? <laughs> Just like, <laughs> I I can't think of any good BBC uh, interviewers. Um, I'm just not familiar familiar enough uh, with the BBC. But oh, that that's some wonderful. I mean, uh, uh, Clark, uh, Jeremy, oh, Jeremy Clarkson. I think. Oh yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's, there's, um, 
uh, they're all coming into my head simultaneously. <laughs> and I, so I know I see their name and their face, and I'm trying to say, who's that, who's that, who's that? Well, for, for our UK viewers, please put them in the comments so we can look them up. But I but just want they, to... But I, I also they, want to uh, put in here, Justin Welby has recently been defending the BBC. Is it because he had a future yeah. job coming up? Is Is this related? No, just he's defending the establishment of okay. which he is example number one. Right. Um, so, oh my, it's crazy. Well, it's, it, luckily, luckily he won't be compelled to sell advertising to support this show because no. I can't see a soap manufacturer as somebody putting money into him. Well, let let's lay out some real quick things here that he doesn't have to worry about. George and Kevin have proven looks have nothing to do with popularity in Anglican interviews. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. um, location? Nope. Nothing to do with it. You just have to be a little bit entertaining, a little funny, a little provocative sometimes, and, and just talk about, just be real. Be yourself. Now, is is being yourself going to work for Justin? We'll, we'll have to see. We'll have to see. So, Justin and the Church of England and uh, some people in the UK may have had some influence in uh, Ghana, and I thought we'd talk about that this week, only because there's a citation to a quote, and we can't find the quote uh, from the Church Times. And I thought you could lay this out to us in uh, good format, George, because it's hard to um, get a handle on the story unless you know the whole story. Give us the background and the story. Okay, the theme is uh, trying to satisfy two masters, talking out of both sides of your mouth. Okay. In November, in November, there was a flap because the bishops of Ghana, 12, 11 dioceses of Ghana, uh, have backed a proposed law to stiffen the proposed penalties to stiffen the sodomy laws, the technical term in Ghana, penalties for homosexual conduct behavior. Uh, they've been on the books since the 60s. Now they're being changed from misdemeanor to a felony. The... Uh, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury denounced these laws and the uh, Ghanaian bishops. The Ghanaian bishops then contacted Welby and said, why didn't you talk to us first? And Welby apologized back down and had some private video Zoom meetings with the Ghana bishops. Well, and that sort of ended it, except some dioceses in England, like Suffolk and other places, which have links to God dioceses in Ghana, they began to do little localized actions of cutting off support for joint projects, vowing to end uh, link relationships, things of that nature. Well, the Church Times ran a story in this week's issue, came out yesterday, saying that the primate of Ghana and the bishops of Ghana have put out a new statement last week saying that the proposed laws that they're backing as they're written are too harsh. And it then goes on, the Church Times then goes on to quote part of this statement saying the laws are too harsh. And so it looks like from an English perspective, the Ghana bishops are basically going Justin Welby's way. They're sort of responding to the concerns of English dioceses with whom they have linked relationships, that the letters they're getting from the English bishops and concerned clergy are persuading them to do something different. Here's the problem. This statement has not appeared publicly in Ghana. It's only appeared in the Church Times. So we've not run it on Anglican Inc. And Anglican Inc. is almost always the place where you find breaking African church news. And what I think this is, is and the Anglican Church of Ghana has a very active press office, has a very active website and Facebook page. And this statement is nowhere to be seen. And I went through their, their releases and statements and announcements just to make sure, because I just did an article about the new bishop, Suffragan Bishop of Temo, uh, Suffragan Bishop of Accra. You know, it's not like I'm not paying attention and there's nothing well, there. They have an active Facebook page. I mean, th there's a lot there you can, uh, if they had said something and made it public, it would be somewhere. And we couldn't find it anywhere. In fact, the Church Times did not uh, give, they cited it, but they didn't tell us where they found it. 
So, yeah. In other words, I like whenever we do so, stuff like this. Uh, remember, we broke the Uganda adultery news. Sure. But we broke it with a copy of the Archbishop's letter mm -hmm. and then our reporting on that letter. We didn't just, you know, we didn't uh, just say we've been told confidentially X, Y, Z. We we needed to be able because it was such an extraordinary statement. We needed to be able to have other people look at it and say they're not making it up. Now I'm not accusing the Church Times of making it up. Their reputation isn't worth being no. trashed over an African story. So what we have here is the Ghana bishops playing both ends. They're basically trying to mollify their English critics, keeping cash flowing, at the same time keeping their true beliefs uh, at home in Ghana. And I know it's disappointing to hear about that, but that stuff happens all the time. It happens all the time. We just, we just want to you know bring transparency to it. Um, now... See, and, and the real story would be, if I were the Church Times, the real story would be, I've got this breaking news, here's what it says, plus they haven't shared this at home in Ghana. Yeah, so, <laughs> unbeknownst to Ghana, yeah, absolutely. Uh, next story uh, is a European story, and for me, having followed the Episcopal Church for so many years now, decades actually by now, God, I'm so old, uh, it was not a surprising story, other than the fact this person happened to be defrocked by his adultery. And I can remember you telling me stories about people here in the U.S. who got caught, caught in adultery and uh, they just took a little suspension or a little time off or, you know, it, it's handled a little differently here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this and why it's so strange in this age of the church. Well, you're exa ex absolutely right, Kevin. In the Episcopal Church, um, if you get caught in adultery, in most places, bishops are they're put in the penalty box yeah. for how many seconds or how many minutes. Uh, well, usually you're given a, a suspension with pay for a year, and then you genteely retire after that suspended year is over. We saw that up in Michigan recently, mm -hmm. um, or in Kentucky recently, and. Uh, bishops are human beings. They will, they will have moral failings, and they'll get nailed. But in the Episcopal Church, and even the the Acna Bishop uh, in the upper in uh, the Great Great Lakes, was given a chance to repent, come clean, and he was nailed because he couldn't, he wouldn't uh, come. He, he was unable he got, to fulfill the obligations of the College of Bishops who said, you have a problem, we will give you treatment. If that doesn't work, then we'll, we'll take it a step further and you'll be dismissed. So that's sort of the, that's the, and that's sort of the situation in, in the North America. Mm -hmm. Sweden, Church of Sweden, is as loosey-goosey liberal uh, far out as they come. I mean, my goodness, they, you know, any sort of kookiness, it's happening in Sweden right now. Well, the Bishop of Visby, Thomas Peterson, Thomas Peterson, uh, Thomas Peterson, was seven of his clergy filed a complaint against him, accusing him of having adult, committing adulterous relationships with a member of his staff, a woman on his staff. And Peterson was brought before church court. He admitted that he did this, and the court then and there stripped him of his all priestly and Episcopal authority. And he went from being Bishop Pedersen to Mr. Pedersen in one day with no right to appeal. And the Swedish church said he violated his consecration vows and he brought disgrace upon the church. And out he goes. And Kevin, maybe it's something to do with Scandinavians or Swedes because, you know, you're from that part of the world. I mean, you're g genetically from that part of the world, but you got to follow the rules. And you uh, got to follow the rules. No, I mean, yeah, you think of that type of the world, Norway, a land of conquest. Uh, you, you, if you left Norway on a business trip, you were going to conquest something. You know, it, and so Sweden decided at some point they were going to be a little bit more neutral. And it's really, if you look at your average Swedish seminary it's so bad george you know it i don't think we need to get a greater discussion of that right now 
but uh, it's interesting that you it's you you'll get more uh, penalty for adultery in Sweden than you will here in America. Uh, ooh, next part, on our list. Part of, part, oh, yeah, I think part of it is those culture of uh, the Swedes are very law-abiding people. Yes, Scandinavians yeah. are very law-abiding people. Sure. Yeah, and Americans aren't. Uh, well, <laughs> Well, 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 gross generalization, <laughs> no. gross overstatements and simplifications, but uh, no, the revolution. Um, just <coughs> mm. all right. So next on our list of news items is uh, uh, Bishop Tim Dakin has uh, uh, retired, and he gave a, his little final service. And I thought we'd talk a little bit about that. It made Anglican not ink, so it, it's certainly newsworthy and. Uh, yeah, but before we get into it, I, I do want you to discuss why this matters uh, in kind of the recent history the Church of England has had with Tim Dakin. Tim Dakin's been Bishop of Winchester for about 10 years. It's one of the major sees financially, historically, this and that. He came out of nowhere. He had been the head of the Church Mission Society and then was made Bishop of Winchester. With Tim was very destructive. He was very dictatorial. He was very, uh, he was a bastard. Uh, and he was infamous for using non-disclosure agreements to get rid of troublesome clergy. Uh, Gavin Nashenden had some very flaming rows where um, Gavin has told this story on this show in the past many times about uh, Dakin just being, you know, my words, a horrible person. Well, and then uh, people went into his background investigation and found not everything was on the up and up. Well, finally, this past last year, the uh, said, look, unless you resign, we're going to take a vote of no confidence in your leadership. Mm. And the Canterbury got involved and they basically put the screws on uh, Dakin to take early retirement. And so this past week, Dakin had his final service, a farewell service at the cathedral in uh, uh, Winchester. And unusually for English, who are known for their stiff upper lip and restraint, he became very emotional in the prayers. He had to pause several times. He lost his composure. And one cannot read his mind. Was he weeping over his lost ministry opportunities? Was he weeping over the embarrassment of being toughed out of a job? We don't know. Was he going through the agony of Christ on the cross? I don't know. Well, but it was quite quite something that was un-English, if you will. Last time I and saw an Englishman cry was Downton Abbey. So, mm -hmm. uh, but in, in that reality, if Kevin can be redeemed and George can be redeemed, it's redeemable. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the top sinner, uh, classification has been claimed by, by, by Paul. I'm claiming second. Okay. And <laughs> just like, you know, I, I just want to be sure that people understand what we're not coming at this from holier than thou. We're coming at this from, Hey, maybe there's a chance here for redemption and repentance and, uh, God can continue to use Tim. Awesome. Well, what else I think we're going to see is I've talked to some of our friends in the publishing world, and especially in England, there are going to be one or two newspapers that shortly are going to be breaking stories sure. by clergy forced to sign non-disclosure agreements by Tim Dakin when they were forced out of the diocese. And now that Dakin is gone, I don't think there's any uh, desire by the Diocese of Winchester to hire lawyers to defend Dakin, and now that he's out. And so we're going to see stories where things that were hidden will now be made clear mm -hmm. and the reasons why he was so unpopular and why it reached the unprecedented stage of the, the, the diocese threatening to impeach him for want of a better word took place so the Dakin story is not over just because he's gone mm -hmm. the Dakin story is actually going to break wide open now that the threat of his legal action against people who he's gotten rid of is over on to the next story, National Prayer Breakfast. You know, something's happened here in America. The president 
will attend, the Congress will attend, invited dignitaries will attend. Eric Metaxas uh, became very famous for his uh, a speech at the prayer breakfast probably eight or nine years ago, maybe 10 years ago now. And so it, it, it's, it's an event that we have here in America called the National Prayer uh, Breakfast. And this year it's a little different, George. A little bit different, yeah. a little smaller. Little. I mean, little um, starting, I guess, with Bill Clinton mm -hmm. and through all the presidents since then, the National Prayer Breakfast grew. It, it meets, it would, used to meet at the Washington Hilton. And you get about 3,000 people ministers minister members of congress mm -hmm. thought leaders religious leaders and it's basically where the president would go and bill clinton would have all the black ministers lay come and lay their hands on them and mm -hmm. pray for him and uh, same thing for barack obama and donald trump donald trump the same way yes <laughs> same way and in other words it was uh, both an exercise in, in cementing your relationship with religious groups, whether it's the black church, the evangelical church, the Roman Catholic church, whatever it was, Barack Obama would do the same uh, sorts of thing. This year, under the COVID uh, banner, there are no guests. It's just members of Congress, one or two invited speakers, some members of the administration. So no Eric Metaxases, no leaders of the black church, no Catholic cardinals, no Episcopal bishops, no Acna bishops, Foley Beach isn't there. No. The, the, the reason is, well, we're scared of COVID, of course. <laughs> and I, my political sense is that, well, that's the public polite excuse. But I think the Biden administration has lost such uh, credibility that they can't count on the allegiance of the black church anymore. Um, recent poll shows that 50% of African Americans would support impeaching Joe Biden. Um, and the more church active you are, the more, uh, the higher that number goes. So of course, white evangelicals, uh, went 95 percent for donald trump um and you can't hold a national prayer breakfast just with michael curry uh because the, the mainstream mainline establishment liberal churches really don't have the political heft that they used to so i think that so for a face-saving device they just shrunk it down uh to a sort of a, a hell fellow well met uh group so washington hilton didn't have uh its conference room ballroom taken up this year by preachers and presidents all right well let's finish this up it's getting kind of warm in here uh let's talk about the revolution now from time to time we had the arab spring we've had revolutions in the air uh at least for the last decade uh uh 12 years happening around the world and leave it to COVID. And we even had something, uh, an uprising down in Cuba, which is, you know, maybe 150 miles, 120 miles south of where I am right now. Uh, it happened uh, just uh, last June, they were an uprising. From time to time, people in a country get sick and tired of being told what to do by the man, the machine. And it's, for me, having grown up in northern Wisconsin for so many years and having just that understanding that everything about but uh, uh, over that little Canadian border is tundra uh, trees without leaves and people that just talk funny and love curling I was I'm intrigued by the Canadian Revolution that is happening without any support from around the world and very little no support from the press the only people supporting the Canadian Revolution the trucker revolution um, are the truckers and uh, kind of the, the middle class and uh, hardworking Canadians. And is this really a revolution? It's a revolution if they get Justin Trudeau to give up on the, the mandates, the vaccine mandates for truckers going over the border to the U.S. If he gives up on that, they've won the revolution. Yeah, there's several revolutions going on. There's mm -hmm. one in Britain right now, one in, but most uh, for Americans, closest at hand is Canada. 
sure. where you've had the, if you will, the cast of Ice Road Truckers and Highway <laughs> Through Hell. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> those guys have driven their rigs to Ottawa to protest at the government and there are tens of thousands of truckers and the governments, the provincial governments, have done their very best to prevent uh, these people from using the highways, the mounties have tried to stop them. And in the past, Canadians being semi-Scandinavian, being very law-abiding, this would have been enough. No, the anger at the Trudeau government uh, for their unreasonable uh, actions has caused uh, a working class revolution led by working class people. There are no uh, academic Marxists or uh, political op right-wing political oper operatives. Now, the Trudeau administration, uh, uh, aided and abetted by the CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, has called these uh, people uh, Russian agents, stools, uh, stooges of, uh, the po of Vladimir Putin. Sure. And then he calls them white nationalists. Yes. And one of the funny things is that Sikhs make up a it's large a, portion. Sikhs who've, in, Sikhs who've immigrated from India to Canada, a lot of them are in the trucking industry for some business, yeah. reason. And a lot of these guys are Sikhs. So now you have Sikh white nationalists from Russia. Um, <laughs> from Russia. <laughs> so the Canadian government has, and the abated uh, by the press has either downplayed that or denigrated that, calling them traitorous, calling them bigots, homo, mm -hmm. uh, trans transphobes. Uh, well, they forced Justin, Justin uh, Trudeau. Trudeau to right. flee Ottawa. The president fled the palace with the approaching revolutionaries. There, and more revolution has taken place than ever took place on January 6th in Washington. Well, now, but now from the religious perspective, where is the church? Where is the church? And that um, the Anglican Church in Canada is like the CBC. It is an arm of the Canadian elite establishment. Sure, absolutely. And, the, and if you look on the Anglican Journal or any of the Anglican Church of Canada's websites for news, they have news about, you know, how about systematic racism, about reaching out to indigenous tribal people, all the sort of liberal motifs and talking points and they're totally absent they're silent about the uh revolution unfolding at their feet now the revolution and took the oh, the riots that took place last summer in canada in uh, cuba which uh is 90 miles from Key West, so it's about 250 from you, Kevin. I said, okay. Uh, I'm new here. I don't know distances. Yeah. Well, the uh, that was resolved by the police arresting all the leaders, and these guys are languishing in, in the Isle of Pines prison. They're still in prison, and, and they're still being tortured, and how dare you, you step out of line. And so that revolution went nowhere. But I guess where I'm going with this is that the lack of moral authority that the Anglican Church of Canada has is is, is only is not shocking when you compare it to the Church of England, but nobody cares what they have to say. In England, we're seeing Boris Johnson, a slow motion revolution, getting rid of him. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is it's an ethical revolution, a moral revolution. Now, in Britain, you either love or hate uh, your your prime minister, your yeah, your prime minister. Susan and I uh, moved to England almost weeks after the election of Tony Blair, and wow. you would have thought Jesus Christ had come to Earth Himself when Tony Blair was elected. Uh, I remember, oh, what was her name, Tracy Ullman, mm -hmm. uh, being on the TV in the United oh, States, mm -hmm. talking about Tony Blair was, you know, the second coming, Jesus Christ with uh with a smart wife and all this and that um and now the queen just gave tony blair knighthood and i don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people have signed a petition asking that it be taken away because of his tremendous uh, unpopularity well boris johnson 
is approaching Theresa May levels of unpopularity, and it's because of hypocrisy of the Johnson government would push these very harsh mask mandates. And then the news and press reported uh, that uh, Johnson and company would go to these parties for government officials. Nobody was wearing masks. It's like Gavin well, Newsom, but, but, the governor but, of California yeah, at the football game. Yeah, well, I'm going to say, if that's the standard, no politician at all should be uh, maintaining their job, retaining their job right now. We've had Gavin Newsom, you've had uh, Biden, you've had every politician I can think of around the world has two personas. One for the camera, where they had the mask, or Zoom calls with Biden in the mask, and one for the rest of us. Or, I'm sorry, one for his uh, his friends and parties. No mask, beer, and arm around somebody laughing. You know, that it's, it's completely different. Yeah, I mean, at the... Uh... Was it the NFC or the AFC Championships? The football yes, game out in so. California yeah. this past yeah. week. Gavin Newsom, the Go California has probably the most extreme lockdown and mandates. And Newsom went, you know, the governor of California, who just survived a recall effort because of his unpopularity, was photographed, with, I think it was with Magic Johnson, or a, a sports pro, arm in arm, smiling without masks at the football stadium. And then there was the mayor of Los Angeles, Gil Garcetti, who was footballed with another celebrity without a mask at the same game. Now, Garcetti said, well, I was, I didn't inhale. Like, you know. <laughs> he didn't say that. That's, <laughs> that's a Bill But in California, joke. everybody <laughs> else at the football stadium had to wear a mask. Sure. A penalty of being kicked out of the stadium and fined and arrested. Mm -hmm. Now, this is, this is. The revolution that's happening to Boris Johnson is sort of akin to that. The hypocrisy of Johnson that he and his cronies can tell the rest of the country how to behave, yet they can ignore that. The question is, where's the Church of England? I believe that people like, if Justin Welby used his half hour show to talk about the morality of hypocrisy, then that really would be an ample good use of his time where Justin Welby speaks on moral issues dealing with the life of the church mm -hmm. but because the church has been so you know they talk about politics all the time about nobody nobody gives a damn what they have to say because they've shot their bolt and the the, the ability to influence opinion and to bring things to a right conclusion has been lost to them yeah, yeah. Um, and they're not gonna they're not gonna have any place it, in other words i'm seeing these news you know conservative and backbench mps who are known for their deep christian faith are abandoning boris johnson because of his moral failings this is perfect territory for the church to step in to either defend him or condemn him and when they if they've stepped in it's really not resonated outside of the a small echo chamber of their own friends and th and there's there's the biggest problem the biggest problem is they've lost their voice nobody cares what the church of england a once very powerful religious and political entity in the world you know 19th century and before is is, is petered out nobody cares anymore they don't care so much that they're, they're willing to put the leader of the anglican communion and Archbishop of Canterbury in front of the BBC program for half an hour a day because they're not worried he's going to convert anybody. They're not afraid that Justin Welby is going to learn, lead anybody to repentance. They're not. He's not going to be pulling a Billy Graham. He's not going to be pulling uh, people back into the churches. At most, at most, they will just have a whimsical view at the end of the program. Well, uh, yeah, okay. At most. It's not always been this way. George Bell, when he was Bishop of Chichester yeah, during right. the Second World War, that's right. in the House of Lords, stood up to condemn the bombing, mass bombings of German cities and civilians. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, the, the, the bombing campaign the, uh, where Britain, after a certain point, stopped targeting factories because the technology was such they just couldn't really it. guarantee they could hit anything. They just, Perfect. okay, let's just wipe out Hamburg. Yeah, Let's burn the destroy city down. the housing stock. Burn the city down. And George Bell, the Bishop of Chichester, 
while affirming the rightness of the fight against the Nazis, said this is something we should not, cannot do because it is war against innocent civilians. Winston Churchill was so angry about Bell's intervention in the House of Lords that when William Temple died, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Chit Bell was the uh, presumed next person. And, jo and Justin uh, Winston Churchill blackballed uh, George Bell so he would not become the Archbishop of Canterbury because his political influence on a moral issue was so profound. Um, would it be that the bishops of the Church of England had that moral authority where they could have spoken at, you know, Tom Wright, N.T. Wright, Tom Wright spoke out against uh, the war in Iraq uh, way back. I remember this at the time when Tony yes. Blair was starting to become unpopular and popular. N.T. Wright was Bishop of Durham. Yeah, 90, 91. Yeah, a long time ago. Mm, yeah. No, this was the second one, uh, oh, 97, 98, 99. Okay. Uh, not the first, not George Senior, but George Junior. You said George. Or, or okay, okay, George. No. All right. Okay. All right. Tom Tom Wright uh, spoke against the war in Iraq, mm -hmm. but he did so parroting the uh, labor talking points rather than moral talking points, so that what he said really didn't have any persuasion. He didn't come at it from a bi Episcopal biblical perspective. Johnson Tomo, for instance, would talk about, he took off on TV, he was famous for taking off his clerical collar and cutting up the scissors and saying, I'm not going to wear a clerical collar. And oh, then, yeah. and he calls, and, and we should send in troops to depose Robert Mugabe. But then he supported the war in Iraq. So in other words, uh, how, the ability, the prophetic, I think, is lost when you don't know when to shut up. The prophetic is lost. that comes out of your mouth. But when the prophetic is lost, you become pathetic. The Church of England yes. right now is pathetic. And I, I hate to say it because, you know, I love to visit there. I love to see the culture. I love the churches, the cathedrals, um, all that. Here's what I love. I love all that... The Church of England used to be. I love the the the, the great religious uh, organization that it was, but it, it's not there anymore. Um, I, I and I pray that uh, Justin Welby's uh, half hour interview program turns into a half hour of theology, a half hour of uh, what Christ means to Britain now, you know, a half hour of you know how the the church uh, is here to adore and worship the Lord. But, you know, I'm not going to get Kevin, my wish. <laughs> yeah. Kevin, before we sign off, I do have one item I'd like to share. Sure. Um, I didn't mention it to you. Uh -oh. um, Kevin, you and I were aware last year about the former Bishop of Chester, Peter Forster. Sure. Uh, Church of England. He attended the uh, ACNA uh, convocation in Latrobe, mm -hmm. PA. He did. Last he time him. I met him in person. Wait, we both met him. He was person. one of the few Church of England bishops who would stand publicly side by side with the ACNA. He's mm -hmm. retired. Towards the end of his time at Chester, he got in trouble over failure to be as aggressive on uh, the abuse with some bad clergy and whatnot. Wasn't that he did anything himself bad? He just didn't hammer people to the degree that they should have been hammered. He didn't hold people accountable, we, and that will get you fired from England as well as Pittsburgh. Go on. We were told that he had joined the Roman Catholic Church, and this was uh, before. My, this is roughly around the Michael Nazar Alley, roughly after. You know, this was around that time, and we didn't report it. Mm -hmm. and the reason why we didn't report it was because basically he said. It wasn't, he didn't want to talk about. It. I mean, it wasn't, this is not it, something he wanted to it wasn't go with yet, yes. And well, the Church Times sort of broke the embargo this week and reported that last year Peter Forster uh, joined, the, joined the Anglican Ordinary. Now, we were able to report all the other stories because the news originated from the Anglican Ordinary or the Catholic Church. 
or Gavin Ashenden saying that I have joined the Catholic Church, prominent Church of England leaders who fled under the Catholic Church. From, uh, if you will, from a media perspective, there's certain things like, we're not going to say that so-and-so is gay until they make a statement to that Absolutely. effect. Why would you? And, I, and I'm not yeah. saying yeah. being yeah. gay is like being Catholic. I'm not saying that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but people can have fun with that analogy all they want. But the point is that they're, or I'm getting divorced or things like that. In other words, there's certain personal issues that you have to respect the individual's wishes uh, unless or until it becomes a public matter. Mm -hmm. And a retired Bishop of Chester's conversion, uh, entering the Catholic Church, if he didn't want that public and if the ordinary didn't publish it, we're really not going to run with that. But the Church Times, I think, because the ordinary has not said anything yet, and the Church Times sort of came across it this week too, and they, they uh, broke the news unless Peter Forster is now happy with it. But the mm -hmm. article in the Church Times didn't quote him on this point. Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how that. that turns out. Well, this brings us to the end of what I want to just based on news or temperature, a hot and steamy Anglican unscripted. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been li listening to episode 716 of Anglican Unscripted. Mm -hmm.